doesn't she? She's got a great touch to that panel. Thanks, KT. Welcome to the worship at Eden Prairie United Methodist Church. I'm glad that you're joining us here in the sanctuary or online. I'm Pastor Becky Joe, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I'd love to know that you're working with us today. So if you're here in the sanctuary, you can fill out a connect card that's attached to your bulletin and drop those in the back in the connect card baskets at the tables as we worship today. If you're worshiping with us online, you can uh, follow uh, the link at the bottom of the, um, of the Facebook post to find the QR code, or you can find, or you can find the link to our website, or you can just go to our website, praiseyourself.org, and fill out the connect card. That's also where you'll find many ways to give to the ministries of God through this church. If you're here in the sanctuary, there are even more ways, so you can look at the green card in front of you and, and figure out which way is best for you to offer your generosity and your stewardship to the ministries of God through the church. I um, also want to pray with you today. So if you have prayer joys or prayer concerns, we'd love to know what they are and share them together. Uh, so you can fill out the yellow prayer card in front of you. If you're worshiping online, you can drop your prayer in, request in the um, comment section, and that will get to me, and we'll share our prayers together so we can pray for and with one another later in worship. I want to remind those of you worshiping with us online that today's a communion Sunday, so if you can grab whatever bread and drink you have on hand, later we'll bless those, and we'll share t communion together um, in the sanctuary and at home. Bart, would you gather us for worship? Sometimes it takes a lot to arrive in this space, ready to open our hearts to God. So I invite you to close your eyes for a moment of centering. Close your eyes and still yourself, breathing in and out. lenses to look at the story of Jonah, we are going to discover that it's more than a story about a big fish. You'll see that clearly in this abridged account from the book of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. The sailors were afraid, and each cried to his God. Then they said to Jonah, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. 
But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out onto the dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, where I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from punishment. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and said, sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about that bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to join with me in singing hymn 2152, Change My Heart, O God. We started with the not-so-child-friendly children's story of Noah and the Ark. If you were here, you know that we looked through the lenses of cultural and historical context and curiosity and taking the Bible seriously by asking what it means for us today. And through those lenses, we were able to see that the rainbow is not just a promise God makes to us, but as an invitation God from God to board the arcs of compassion and empathy, peace and justice as an, uh, as an intentional alternative to escalating human violence. Last week, we tackled the not even adult friendly story of the binding of Isaac, looking with a literary lens and discovering that Abraham was being invited into a new understanding of God to come into a fuller understanding of a God of compassion and love. Some of you may be finding these new lenses helpful in your search through scripture. Some of you may still feel like your vision's a bit blurry when you try these lenses on. I give thanks that you're at least willing to try them on together in this space, and I bless you to choose whatever, whether the lens works for you or not. I just invite you to come to that conclusion yourself. Today we look at another story intriguing to children, especially if we focus just on the front part of the story, right? Jonah is a fascinating character because his story involves living in the belly of a big fish, but it is so much more than just a fish story. Jonah is a prophet of God, meaning God calls on Jonah to be God's megaphone to the people of God. In the book of Jonah, we learn that God wants Jonah to speak a word to the Ninevites. Jonah was to tell them of their wrong ways and then get them to repent or turn their lives around, and then God would be able to bless the people of Nineveh. But Jonah didn't like the Ninevites. We'll get into why a little later. So instead of Jonah going to Nineveh, he hops a boat headed in the opposite direction, to Tarshish as far away from God and the call of God on his life. 
while on that boat a storm comes up and everyone made the assumption because they did in those days that someone had angered their God. So when the sailors discovered it was Jonah and his God that he had angered, then they threw Jonah overboard and all of a sudden the waters became still. But Jonah doesn't get off with an easy death by drowning. I say that because remember that he wants to escape the call of God on his life, and I think he'd just as soon die than to actually go to Nineveh and preach to the people. So he thought drowning would be better, and instead God sends this big fish to swallow Jonah up. Jonah lives three days in the belly of that big fish, And after three days, Jonah is, as our scripture says, vomited out onto dry land. I love that (laughs) translation. And God reiterates God's call on Jonah's life. Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. This time, Jonah doesn't try to escape the call of God on his life. This time, he heads to Nineveh and proclaims what God asks. Jonah's pretty good at his prophet gig, it turns out, because the people repent. They turn from their ways, and they, uh, they stop being evil, and God changes God's mind about them, and God acts with grace toward them and loves the people of Nineveh. But Jonah, he's not happy about that. He did what God asked of him, and it worked. And for some reason, we'll discuss that in just a bit, he's not at all pleased about that. He didn't want that to happen. The people of Nineveh are his enemies. And he's ticked off that God would be so gracious with his enemies. He's so upset, he asks God to take his life. In other words, if you aren't going to destroy my enemies, God, then destroy me. That's quite a place to live, isn't it? Jonah sits and he sulks and he watches what's going to happen to his enemies, especially since they have God's favor now. He doesn't like that at all. God provides a bush to shade Jonah while he sits and sulks, but then the next day it's withered by God's work, and again, Jonah would just as soon die. Then sit there and watch God be gracious and loving to his enemies. We leave the story with Jonah sitting and sulking. God having called Jonah out for his behavior, and without a sense of Jonah ever came around to see this whole situation from God's perspective. Still feeling like he had been wronged by God's graciousness with his enemies. Now, typically, the telling of this story has been focused on Jonah's initial journey, because it's the fun part, right? We like the idea that someone who went against God's directions finds protection in the belly of a big fish, is given a second chance to do what God asked of him, and is successful as a prophet of God. That's a great story. We like a story about a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from punishment. And that's often where we stop reading this story. We love the amazing detail of Jonah being swallowed by a big fish, and that's where we want to put our focus. We don't usually want to deal, what we don't usually want to deal with is Jonah's wish for death twice, or his anger at God's graciousness, or his utter hate for the people of Nineveh, his enemies. So that if we miss these details, I wonder if we miss the whole point of this story. Maybe it's not just about the fish. Perhaps we need to try in some new lenses to make sense of the full story contained in our scriptures. Let's try in the lens of context again, this time the who, what, when, where, why kind of part of that. First, the who is Jonah. And from the scripture, we don't know very much about him. We know his name is Jonah, which means dove. And throughout the Bible, the dove is a symbol of peace, which has its own irony, doesn't it? because he's mad at his enemies, but his name is synonymous with peace. We know that Jonah was given a word from God to preach to the people of Nineveh. In other words, Jonah was a prophet. And we know that he lived and did his work during the tenure of a pretty wicked king, King Jeroboam, who was king from 786 to 746 before the Common Era. That's what we know about the who, what, when, where, why. Jonah's call was to preach to the people of Nineveh. Nineveh represented a grave threat to Israel, Jonah's own country. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, 
which was ultimately responsible for overtaking the Israelite capital of Samaria in 722 before the Common Era. When that happened, the temple was destroyed and the people were exiled to various lands. It turns out Jonah had a good reason to be concerned about the Assyrians or the people of Nineveh. And that's likely why Jonah turned in the opposite direction from the one that God initially gave him. You've heard the middle of the story, so now let's fast forward to the end of Jonah's story. Jonah has been vomited from the belly of the big fish, and Jonah goes to Nineveh. He preaches a message of warning to his enemies, and the response was fast and enthusiastic. Scripture says that everyone repented, and I love this detail, even the animals. All right. God responded with compassion and mercy to the people and animals of Nineveh. In other words, God changed God's mind, and instead of destroying them, God saved the people of Nineveh. And Jonah became angry. He said, this is what I was afraid of. That's why I fled in the beginning. And then Jonah asked God to take his life. Because that doesn't happen, look what happens next. Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city. Now, eastward movement in the Bible is never a good thing. When the first humans were kicked out of the garden, they headed east. Cain moved further east after he murdered his brother Abel. As humans moved eastward, the Bible tells us, they began to build a big city with a tower that attempted to reach to the heavens. East in the Bible is away from our true humanity, away from human flourishing, away from being all that we were made to be as beloved children of God. God appointed a bush to provide shade, and Jonah was happy. And then God sent a worm to attack that bush, and the bush died, and now Jonah's angry again. God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? Jonah says, in dramatic form, of course, yes, angry enough to die. <laughs> and God speaks the closing lines to the story in the biblical account. We didn't read them, so I'm going to read them to you now. You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being one night and perished in a night. And, I, and should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? You know, God's trying to say to him, those are my beloved children. I created them. Should I not be concerned about them? Taking a closer look with a new lens, we might be able to see what this story means for us today, especially when we ask ourselves what this text says about who God is, about humanity, who we are, and about our relationship with our enemies. Let's look at what the text says about God. Jonah, remember, boarded the boat and headed in the opposite direction of Nineveh, and he thought he was not only getting away from his enemies— he also thought he could get away from God. What he discovered is that God's reach is pretty far. We hear that in the message of Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. We learn that God is ever-present, and we cannot escape the loving embrace of God. Let's look at what this text says about humanity and our enemies. When we see through the lens of the greater scope of the biblical stories, we discover there are really two types of prophets in the Bible. There are prophets with a nationalist vision, with a message or a hope that God is going to <clears throat> destroy their enemies, that they will come out on top, and that they will have this kind of victory in battle. Obadiah and Jonah are two examples of that. The other type of prophet is one with a universal vision, with a different kind of message, a message that God will, in the end, bring peace on earth, embracing all nations together. It is not a vision of a victory. It is a vision of real, lasting, healing peace for all people. Isaiah is the best example we have of this type of prophet in the scriptures. God wants Jonah 
to be God's megaphone for a universal vision. We see in the end that God cares for the Ninevites in the same way God cares for Jonah and the people of Israel. And in God's care for the people of Nineveh, they are spared from death and destruction. This universal vision of God and God's people is what we are called to in our generation. A vision of God's love that is boundless for everyone and everything. It changes how we see our enemies. It changes how we understand our responsibility in this world. Remember that part of the larger biblical story for us is the teachings of Jesus as well. And in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That message is expanded in Luke's Gospel in a really practical way. Listen to what Luke's, Luke's Gospel says. Jesus' words, But I say to you who are listening, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your own shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you. And if anyone takes away what is yours, do not ask for it back again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. The golden rule. The book of Jonah, in light of this greater context of our biblical story, calls us, I think, to see all humans everywhere as worthy of, God, of our love and care. Not just our own people, not just Christians, not just Americans, not just people who who like the things that we like, and not just people of the same political persuasion as us. The book of Jonah invites us to see our species, our humanity, not just our group, as our responsibility. As John Wesley put it, the world is our parish. Everybody is under our care. Author Josh Scott writes, maybe the story of Jonah is trying to show us that regardless of where we live, what our religion is, who we love, how we vote, or any number of other things that make us different from one another, we all share the same planet. Our success or failure as a species is intricately connected. Ultimately, the story of Jonah is more than just a fish story. It is a story that invites us to ponder some questions. Will we participate in petty back and forth passive aggression? Will we seek to have the last word or to cause the other harm? Will we hate our enemies to our own destruction? Will we be swallowed up by hate and bigotry? Will we experience the self-induced exile that refusing to seek peace and understanding will lead to? Will we participate in political discourse that makes enemies? Because friends, God shows us and invites us into a different way. May our thoughtful and prayerful answers lead to actions, and may those actions not seek so much a victory for me and mine, but work toward a real and a lasting healing peace for all God's beloved children. Let us pray. God, when our tables are too small, move us to expand them. When our compassion is exclusive and our mercy too narrow, may we hear the Spirit calling us to welcome inclusion and kindness. When, like Jonah, we choose to run from participation with you or allow our bitterness and anger to limit our understanding of your love, may we find ourselves overwhelmed by it so much that we can't help but share it. When we are swallowed up in our narrowness, May we be reminded of just how expansive your love for everyone and everything really is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
we have the blessing today to come to this table that God has opened to all people. The welcome table, as the choir just sang about it, a table that's open to everybody at every stage of their life and every stage of their faith journey. You can come here whether you're a member of this church or not at any age. Um, we welcome you to this table of God because this is God's table, not our table, and God welcomes you here. We pray in thanksgiving for the way that God has been from the beginning of history. God's beloved children, not always getting it right, but God again and again welcomes us back to the table, welcomes us back to our created selves and invites us into um, God's way of being in the world. And we learned that through Jonah today where Jonah didn't want God's graciousness and love to extend to people he didn't like. And we can imagine that ourselves, can't we? We can imagine who we're thinking about like Jonah did. And yet, here comes God who doesn't give up on us, who comes again and again with love and grace and inviting us into something so much more. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread from the table and he gave thanks to God and he broke it and he blessed it. And he shared it around the table and he said, take this and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. When you eat this bread, remember me. Remember my love for you and for all. After the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and again he gave thanks to God and blessed it. And he shared it around the table among all of his friends and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant of love and it's poured out for you and for all. For the forgiveness of sins. When you drink from this cup, remember me. Remember my love. And so, in thanksgiving for all the ways that God has demonstrated God's love for us over time, we pray for God's Spirit to pour out upon this bread and this cup and your bread and cup in your homes, that through them we might come to be a part of God's love for all. God's beloved people. As we gather around this table, we gather to pray with one another and for one another. And so I want to share the prayer requests of our community this morning. We pray with Rita Cooper for her friend Rick Steble, I think, who is in hospice. We pray for comfort and peace for Rick and his family and friends. Lord, in your love. We pray with Gail Case for um, her and Tim's friend Sue. She's having a heart ablation on Wednesday and is very apprehensive. And so we pray for Sue and for peace leading into that procedure. Lord, in your love. We pray with Vinton for traveling mercies for friends. Lord, in your love. We pray with Leanne for her cousin Diane who starts chemo this week. And we pray for that journey of healing for her. Lord, in your love. Uh, Mark and Angie Persnick invite us to pray prayers of celebration for Nathan, whose Eagle Scout Court of Honor will be next Sunday. The project that Nathan did is our um, sensory wall in our education wing, and it's such a beautiful addition, and so we pray for that honor for Nathan. Lord, in your love. And we pray for healing for Angie as she recovers from a minor surgery this week. Lord, in your love. And today we also pray, um, we learned that, uh, we pray for the family of Ron Howard, who we learned passed away on September 24th. Uh, you can find his obituary out on the web, but uh, his celebration of life will be at the Cremation Society of Minnesota in Edina on October 9th from 6 to 8 p.m. So we pray for Wanda and for their children and, and for this journey ahead. Lord, in your love. Let's carry all of these prayers and the ones in our hearts, the ones we have not given voice to yet. Let's carry them before God as we pray the words that, God, that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would those helping serve communion come forward? <clears throat>
Uh, we will now talk about uh, ways, just briefly, about some ways that you can be involved in the life of Eden Prairie uh, United Methodist Church here over the next, uh, next week or two. First of all, I'd like to point out that next Sunday, October 8th, is Rainbow Sunday, um, and that is a day where we will be celebrating and recommitting ourselves to the work of full inclusion uh, for our LGBTQIA plus siblings uh, here in the Life of Eden Prairie United Methodist Church. Um, you're invited to wear your favorite color of the rainbow to worship next weekend. Uh, also, in the bulletin, there is a, a tear-off advertisement um, about the rainbow, sun, uh, rainbow Sunday to remind you. You can take it home, put it on your refrigerator or some magnetic surface, or better yet, uh, use that tear-off sheet to invite somebody to join you next weekend. Um, next thing to point out, before next Sunday, on Wednesday night, October 4th, is our first Fall Connections event. Uh, it's an all-ages event. Um, please bring a potluck item to share for dinner and then stay for bingo afterwards. Uh, connections will start at 5.30 and then probably end shortly after 6. I invite uh, Rita Cooper from our Staff Parish Relations team and Becky Coleman, our um, office administrator, for a few short more days. So Becky gets to retire, <laughs> and that is a good thing. Becky, you want to stand here? Each of us at baptism is given gifts by the Holy Spirit for community's good. These gifts do not diminish or end with retirement from employment. Becky, <laughs> we give thanks for the ways you used your gifts among us. With you, we look to your future, trusting that you go with God in all your days ahead. On behalf of the staff, parish, relations team, and this entire congregation, please accept, accept these gifts of celebration in your time, of your time among us. Personal notes of thanks from individuals in the congregation and an electronic gift card was sent to you from the United Methodist Publishing House, Cokesbury, so you can have something to read in your days ahead in which you can delight. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Becky's favorite thing, learning more, yes. reading more, so that's great. I invite you as a congregation to raise your hands forward on Becky, Rita and I will lay hands on Becky, and we'll pray a blessing for her. Eternal God, creator and renewer of life, you continually call us to a rhythm of work and Sabbath rest. In the Sabbath rest of retirement, may Becky discover new meaning for life and new opportunities for serving you. We offer thanks for Becky and her years of faithful work among us. We celebrate Becky, we celebrate for Becky that she has reached retirement and the opportunity to redirect her life in new ways of serving you and the community. As the future unfolds, May all her fear be set aside through deepening trust in your daily grace. Through Jesus Christ, the Lord of life. Amen. Just take your second. Go ahead, say it louder. Okay. There, there we go. Can we show our appreciation for Becky and joy in her being able to retire now? Well, and I would like to also offer my appreciation for the love and kindnesses that you have shown me in the last eight years and grace when I made lots of little silly, silly mistakes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Becky. You can join us today for Becky's retirement celebration. There are two ways you can help with that. There's a table in the lobby where you can fill out a thank you card to Becky. There's several cards there and we'll get them to her. And then, isn't this a great thing? We get cake because Becky's retiring. So there's cake to celebrate Becky's retirement in our fellowship time today. So I hope you'll join us. Would you stand for the blessing? You, are God's beloved child and so is absolutely everyone you meet whether you like them or not whether you agree with them or not whether they like the same things you do or not they are God's beloved child and I pray that as we go into this world that's so full of divisiveness that we would be a people of love and connection 
and peace. May it be so. Amen. I invite you to join with me in singing our closing song, I'm going to live so God can use me.